The Bengals get their fast start. They get a W, and Joe Flacco is not elite. You are Locked On Bengals, your daily Cincinnati Bengals podcast. Part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. What up, Bengals fans, and welcome to another episode of the Lockdown Bengals podcast. I'm your host, Jake Lisko. He's your host, James Rapine. The Bengals move to one and two after defeating the New York Jets on the road, 27 to 12. The defense doing their thing against Joe Flacco and that New York offense that looked like I thought offenses would look against this defense for the last three weeks, and the Bengals capitalized this week. But I think the bigger story and where we start as we are wont to, is with Joe Burrow and this offense. As Burrow hinted at in his Wednesday press conference, the Bengals won the toss in this game and elected to receive the opening kick. And as Joe Burrow pointed out after the game, James, there is some risk to that. If you don't score and the other team gets the ball in and out of the half, which the Jets did, that can set you up for a, a bit of pain sometimes. But the Bengals made good on their get fast intention. And for the second time in Joe Burrow's tenure in Cincinnati, he scored two touchdowns in the first quarter. Yeah, it was, uh, it was fun. Football is supposed to be fun in that first quarter was fun. That first drive was fun. Even the stuff that didn't work was fun. A trick play that didn't work. Why? Because they just start out right away. 13 yards to Tyler Boyd, six yards to T Higgins. And then, yeah, you do the deep ball uh, to chase. Then you convert the third down to T Higgins after a failed mix and run. Like it was just the, things were working and it was, um, it, it was a lot of fun to watch Joe Burrow, eight of 10, 95 yards on that first drive ESPN stats and info said it's the most opening uh, most passing yards on an opening drive since 2014. Like, yeah. so there you go. That's something I want to see from this offense. Right. And so, yeah, it, uh, it it felt like, oh, that's the the Joe Burrow, that's the offense that that we wanted to see. And then he, the other thing that I want to point out, Jake, on that first drive, the fact that they had been struggling, it seems like we've talked about the red zone issues for a long time, right? Not just this year, but for a long time, that they responded after the Cordell Volson holding. After T. Higgins' touchdown, which I thought was a touchdown and still think it's a touchdown, but it wasn't a touchdown for whatever reason you tell me, I don't know, wasn't a touchdown. And they respond again, and Burrow goes off script when they had to have it and find Samaj P. Ryan for a 12-yard score. So uh, I, I really – when that happened, it was like, oh, okay. Like all, all the relaxed stuff, all of those things that was that were talked about, the urgency but no panic, that's what you wanted to see. And they went out and they did it, which is exactly what T. Higgins said earlier this week. He said, hey, we have to just go out there and do it. Well, they did on Sunday on that opening drive. And T. Higgins, part of that really nice game for this offense, one of the better offensive players for the Bengals in this game, along with Tyler Boyd and Samaj P. Ryan, who not only caught that touchdown pass from Joe Burrow off script, doing a good job making himself available near the goal line and then falling backwards into the end zone after Joe Burrow did a nice job of navigating a muddy pocket and getting out of there to find P. Ryan. Also finishing the game really strong. Samaje P. Ryan, one of the stars for the Bengals offense in this game. Not necessarily a sentence I thought I would be saying, but what I did think I would be saying or thought we might be revisiting is did the Bengals capitalize on their opportunity to get right in a game that had ingredients for a get right game? Those of you that listened to our game preview would have heard the reasons that James and I talked about that this had the potential of being a get right game. One of those reasons was the Jets and Robert Salah like to show those single high, uh, single high defenses, run a lot of cover one, a lot of cover three. And you could see that with more of those downfield shots along the sideline from the Bengals in this game, they had those one-on-ones and credit the Jets corners. They, they broke up a couple of them, but the Bengals also hit a couple of, well, hit at least a one big play to T Higgins on the right sideline. And then Tyler Boyd, bouncing off Jordan Whitehead and taking uh, a long yards after catch touchdown from, from Joe Burrow. These are the the parts of capitalizing on trends that we talked about. The Bengals often show that they still do have that capability, especially against those single high coverages. They took advantage of that. That was something I wanted to see this week. 
I feel like Joe Burrow was a lot better in the pocket. His pocket management, his pocket presence, his uh, performance under pressure, I thought all of those things much, much better this week. I do still have some concerns, James, if I'm being honest about the offense, but the fast start certainly very welcome. It put them in the driver's seat for the rest of the game, put the game script heavily in their favor. And I think that these are all things that we can look at, look at in this game as they took care of business. They, they were in control from start to finish. Yes, there are things to clean up. Yes, there are things that you don't like. DJ Reader's injury, one of those that we'll talk about, and hopefully not as bad as it might have initially appeared. But overall a really strong performance to start the game for the offense and then doing enough throughout the game, not quite getting to that 30 point margin because Evan McPherson missed a field goal late in the game, James, but overall, especially on late downs doing pretty well. No, Evan, Evan actually missed that. He told me afterwards, he said, James, I missed that because you said we would win 27 to 20 and I wanted the 27 to be right. So he missed that for me. Just looking out. yeah, that's all he was doing. He's a big listener of Locked on Bengals. Look, um, yeah, definitely some things, some flaws, some some negatives. But the thing that I'm most encouraged about, and you you certainly talked about it a little bit, the pocket presence, it felt like Burrow, it, and part of it is there is no, Carl Lawson isn't Micah Parsons. Part of no. it's that. But part of it was there were lanes. There was ability – uh, there, there, there was lanes for him to go off script, make plays. I thought this offensive line was better. I, I, not great, and we can get to some of the flaws and stuff later in the show, but I thought they were better, and I thought Burrow early on got into that rhythm, was getting the ball out of his hands quick. When he did yeah. have to hold it, he was keeping himself in a throwing position. I mean, did he run? I'm trying to think. I don't remember a scramble today off the top of my head. Now, he did slide there, down there was- once. One, I think. But anyway, continue. Five, five attempts for zero yards. Yeah, he had five yards. So so as long was five yards. So yeah, okay, there you go. So there was no like, all right, I'm pulling this down and I'm going to run for 17 yards and, and slide and, and all of those. Oh, yeah, there was the one. It was in the red slide. zone, right? Yeah, yeah, because he slid, yes. Um, and then he got hit by, by Mosley inadvertently, according to the broadcast, getting up a little bit very clear that he was trying to get that knee into Burrow's helmet, but that's yes. neither here nor there. <laughs> At least to me, that's what I thought. I mean, it's very clear that that's what he was trying to do, but that's the point is he kept his ability to throw through most of it. And there, there weren't a lot of times where he looked uncomfortable and that's what I want to see from Joe Burrow, because we know that he's the, he's the train, he's the engine. And by the way, I do want to talk cause you, I know you tweeted about this in real time, Jamar chase that deep ball on what the third play, the little trick play, he said mm-hmm. he lost it. That's, that's, he, what, he it, lost that's what it looked like. That's what I thought. Going yeah. from one shoulder to the other. He was like, yeah, I had a shot at it. He was like, I lost it. I had to switch shoulders, which is really hard to do on the run. Anyways, you're flipping your, and uh, so yeah, that, that, that was a bummer. Cause I, I love the play. I love the design. It was one of those, let's punch him in the mouth. And it, it worked. I mean, he was open and it just, it didn't work out all the way, but uh, I certainly like that. And uh, unfortunately, it didn't pay off. But they they went down and they scored anyways. They did, and they overcame quite a few obstacles. The the holding penalty on Volson you mentioned, a delay of game. They had two delay of games oh. in this game. Charles Davis on the broadcast was saying he felt like it was maybe a point of emphasis for the officials this year, pointing to a couple other games and and uh, in, infamous playoff non delay of game call that he thinks has put that penalty under the microscope a little bit. But a really nice start to this game in general for the Bengals. That is the big, the biggest positive to me. There, there are a few other positives that we'll talk about as well. Mm, taking advantage of turnovers, one. creating turnovers. Trey Hendrickson had a massive game. Um, th- th- you know, th- they did have that fumble on their second drive that I had totally forgotten about. Mm-hmm. I, I totally forgot that Jamar Chase lost that fumble on that drive, but still more good things that we can talk about in this game, I think. And, and we'll continue to stay on the positive vibes as long as we can here. Because the tape doesn't lie, we'll get into the tape. We'll have our second reactions and all of that after we've had a chance to, to rewatch the game and, and really find the things that still need improvement. Because after any game, an NFL team will tell you there's always things to clean up and get better. And uh, the, the, the good news is not 0-3. Great start to this game. More good things to talk about, which we'll get into 
coming up next. But first, let me tell you about BetterHelp. You've heard me talk about BetterHelp before. You've heard me talk about and extol the virtues of therapy before. It can be tough for the brain to stay in problem-solving mode when things get emotional, when you face a, a problem in life, when you face a challenge. But when you need help, when you learn how to find your own solutions, there's no better feeling. And a therapist can help you become a better problem solver, making it easy to easier to accomplish your goals, whether they're big or small, whether you're Joe Burrow trying to win the Super Bowl or Joe Schmo just trying to get to the grocery store and cook yourself a nice dinner on a Thursday night. BetterHelp makes it easy to switch therapists. It's going to be cheaper than many in-person options. It's accessible. It's affordable. It's entirely online. When you want to be a better problem solver, therapy can help you get there. Visit BetterHelp.com slash LockedOnNFL today to get 10% off your first month. Again, check them out at BetterHelp.com, BetterHelp.com. Jake, let's keep things rolling. And, and you mentioned it, Trey Hendrickson. Yeah. Boy, oh boy, did they they need some pressure, some turnovers. We talked about the fast start, right? So on defense, it was pressure and turnovers, and, and they got it. And Trey Hendrickson was the one who brought it. He was credited for two and a half sacks. I'm going to round up and say three because it's our podcast. So locked on Bengals count, three sacks for Trey Hendrickson, three forced fumbles, the dude um, – and the thing was, Jake, is I thought they were in, like, really key moments. So the first drive of the third quarter where, who knows, if the Jets go down and score there and, and instead Trey Hendrickson says nope, and then the Bengals offense, which did hit a little bit of a rough patch, was given a short field and they scored and they went up another possession and that really set the tone for the second half. And then with about 10 minutes to go, getting to Flacco on that fourth down, that's huge. I mean, that that's that wasn't the ball game, but if they convert there, if you don't get pressure on him, if you allow him to complete a ball to Garrett Wilson or whoever, then the door is wide open again for them to come back. And we're talking about late game, close game, and all of those things. So mm -hmm. I, I thought he was really timely uh, with two of those sacks and made a huge, huge difference today. Yeah, it's something that Hendrickson did last year, I'd say quite a few times, is getting those clutch sacks and big moments for this team. You mentioned – when, when they came, you look at the second half for the Jets. They lost a fumble on their first drive of the second half. That's Trey Hendrickson. They turned it over on downs. That one wasn't Trey Hendrickson. They kick a field goal on a 55-yard drive. So, so no Trey Hendrickson there either. But then another lost fumble. That's Trey Hendrickson. And then uh, I believe there was one other sack at some point that was a forced fumble as well that the, that the Jets recovered. So I, I must have missed that in that recap. But the second half for the Jets, turnover, turnover, Field goal, turnover, turnover. And the Bengals probably could have had another three turnovers in this game. Eli Apple nearly had a pick when Jesse Bates came on a zero blitz off the edge and forced Joe Flacco to throw the ball quickly. Apple undercut it, nearly had a pick six opportunity. And I think Cheeto Wuzier had a couple opportunities for interceptions on deep balls where he was in great position and got his hand on the football. So a lot of big plays out there for this team to be made. And they made enough of them in this game between Jesse Bates collecting the, the game ceiling just to put a close to any drama at the end of the game. Logan Wilson making a great play, sprinting straight back from yeah. in the A-gap. Sugar in the A-gap, as we talk about, like on the line of scrimmage, straight back almost 30 yards to, to make an interception on Tampa 2 in the middle of the field. And, and Trey Hendrickson's two, three strip sacks, two of which were recovered, by the Bengals. Really, really productive game for Hendrickson and a couple of big contributions from others. I thought Bomb Bell, by the way, also played a really nice game while we're on the topic of the secondary and Mike Hilton as well, uh, tackling really well and just a, a really nice game for that back seven in general. Mm -hmm. And and also Trey Hendrickson. DJ Reader, the other note on, on the defense that we need to talk about was playing another great game. Left the game, was very quickly declared out with a knee injury. Left knee got rolled up on on a running play. He, I, I was worried. I was straight worried when this happened. I still am worried. I'm still dreading the news a little bit, but there was a positive update in the locker room. Yeah, there was. And basically he was encouraged. The reason he didn't come out for the second half and watched it from inside the locker room, you want to keep him off the knee as much as possible. But – 
Uh, the, the other part of this, he said he told Jay Morrison of the Athletic he was encouraged uh, by things, and it wasn't. It doesn't seem like it's as bad as it looked. Because when you saw it, it was like, oh my God, he was able to walk off under his own power. So hopefully this is a relatively minor thing. Hopefully he can avoid injured reserve. I don't know. I yeah. I don't know. I don't even think the Bengals know. But uh, hopefully uh, hopefully it's nothing too, too serious for DJ Reader. And, and before I forget, because you know me, I'm Mr. Wide Receiver. I, I do want to talk about a guy who uh, was all over the field like a receiver, but he was he was actually filling in. You notice 59 out there? Akeem Davis Gaither, I thought, played pretty well, uh, you know, without Jermaine Pratt. And and I, I thought know, he, I thought he and, filled in admirably in more of a true linebacking role. Previously yeah. this year, when we've seen him on the field, has kind of been in a specialist sub package role. And I thought he did pretty well as a linebacker today. Yeah, exactly. You know, nine tackles solo, 13 total, one tackle for loss. Thought he played well. And so that's, um, that's something you want to see. How, how does he do in that type of role? Because he's not going to – that role isn't available because they have a Jermaine Pratt and they have a Logan Wilson. But at some point it might be available like it was today. So I, I was uh, excited to see that. And, and the thing is that one thing the Jets do really well, I think they get their running backs in space and, and they find ways to get Brees Hall the ball and they find ways to get uh, Michael Carter Jr. the ball. And um, especially Hall today, they did. And I thought yeah. the Bengals – for the most part, there were a couple misses, but for the most part, tackled really well. Yeah, Brees Hall is a big part of their game plan, especially on third down. He had 11 targets in this game, caught six of them for 53 Ooh. yards, but Ooh. a few of those, a few of those were on Flacco. One of them was just a, a drop that was thrown behind, but Flacco had to get rid of the ball a little bit early. That could have been a big play for the Jets early in the game. The Bengals get off the field instead on that particular play. So, yeah, Brees Hall was featured, and, and the Bengals did a number of things to, to try to guard him. It wasn't just linebackers. I, I noticed at one point in the game, Trey Flowers had a rep where he was manned up or, or across from Brees Hall when Brees Hall was split out wide. Uh, last note on DJ Reader real quick before we forget about this one as well. Kelsey Conway asked DJ if he's going to be able to play on Thursday, which would be very ambitious, I think, on a short week after being quickly declared out. According to Kelsey, he told her, we'll see. So I, I think that speaks to the unknown nature of this injury, but certainly him not just shutting it down and saying, you know, I, I don't know what he would say there. I, I, I mean, maybe you just say, we'll see either way, but certainly the fact that he's available talking to people is, is encouraged about things. Hopefully it's not too bad. It would be a pretty big loss for this team. DJ Reader, incredibly important to this defense, but it seems like maybe they've escaped anything too bad. And and same is true for Trey Hendrickson, who had to leave this the game at some point. He came back in after mm -hmm. he left with an injury at one point. T. Higgins got rocked in the head on a brutal and I think like dirt. I, I don't know. I don't like to throw dirty around. It could have been avoided. It was a I'm helmet. It was a helmet to a face mask. It's you know, one of those things. Didn't like to see it, but he was okay, cleared from the concussion and might have had a little bit of blood on his lip, but came back into yeah. the game and played well. Yeah, he did. And I, I thought T played great. Um, the Tyler Boyd touched on 18 minutes in. We haven't mentioned that. The fact that it, it honestly, one of the best parts of the post game. I, I did mention was, it. Uh, okay. Well, one of the best parts about the post game, good call, is Joe Burrow, Jamar Chase. I'm trying to think of T did. I think it was just Joe Burrow and Jamar Chase. Both poking fun at Tyler yeah. Boyd <laughs> burrow. Like he finally broke a tackle. <laughs> That's right. hilarious. Jamar Tyler's so slow. I was trying to catch up to get a block on, on, on one of those guys that were chasing him like hilarious, like just, uh, just razzing him. So, um, and, and if you're Jamar chase, you probably do think Boyd is slow because <laughs> you're just super fast because you're Jamar chase, but That's right. was a, uh, was a huge play in the game um, and, and kind of hid. And I, I think we'll get to some of the negatives coming up in a second, kind of hid some of those struggles because he broke t some tackles and was able to turn that into the biggest play of the season. Uh, last thing, since we were on the topic of playing Thursday, I asked Lyle Collins straight up, you playing Thursday? He said, I'm playing Thursday. So I don't anticipate him being out, even though there was some speculation and not speculation. There was some chatter about his back because he didn't practice. Didn't, didn't he say, if I can walk, I'm playing? Wasn't that pretty uh, it much was, the quote? 
basically that. Yeah, I forget exactly yeah. what he told me, but it was like that. I'm like, okay, I'll take I, that. I, I don't want to call them negatives, games, but James, but I, I do think I want to talk about some of the questions that I, I still have or, or maybe we have that, that we need to talk about throughout this yeah. week leading up to Thursday's game. We'll finish the show there coming up next. But first, I have to tell you about Schultz and Sons Jewelers because we're so excited that we've partnered with Matt Schultz and the Schultz and Sons family. They've been in the Cincinnati area since 1953, located in Fort Mitchell, and they're big Bengals fans. So I know Matt and his family really excited right now because the Bengals get a huge road win. And look, if you're looking for something customized, if you're looking for just advice about what to look for, what to target, what fits your style, what fits her style. Schultz and Sons is the place to go. They're part of the American Gem Society. What does that mean? Well, AGS is an exclusive club. One in 20 jewelers have met the exacting requirements to join AGS. So you're getting the best advice from leading experts and local flavor, local um a local establishment that is going to give you what you're looking for and their Bengals fans to make it even better. So if you're visiting this week for the Thursday night game, make sure you check out Schultz and Sons They're on Dixie highway in Fort Mitchell, right off the exit. Uh, so right off the highway, I mean, it's right there, right across uh, or, or right in Kroger Plaza. So when you're looking for that special piece, for a loved one or yourself, like a hot take chain, stop by, tell them that you two are a Bengals fan and a Locked On Bengals listener. And if you want to check them out online, go to SchultzDiamonds.com. That's S-C-H-U-L-Z Diamonds.com. S-C-H-U-L-Z Diamonds.com. James, a lot of really good things to talk about in this game. I, I thought Cordell Volson hold aside on the touchdown that was called back early, I thought, from what I've seen. So far, I thought he played pretty well. But – we can talk about the offensive line again. We can talk about the offense when they stagnated a little bit in the middle of the game. Again, we can talk about Joe Mixon maybe a little bit here. I don't really have a whole lot of negatives for the defense. I do have concerns if DJ reader can't play about the long-term uh, so, some long-term stuff and run defense in particular and holding up on the inside. And we saw some of that late in this game, but the game script was so in their favor. It didn't matter, but let's start offensive line. I thought better. But I do think that there were still potentially some communication issues out there. I thought that there were still occasionally some protection issues. And I thought Joe Burrow in this game did a much better job of making the offensive line look better than he did yep. in the first two games. So I think probably what we're going to see when we see the, you know, the PFF grades come out and we get our hands on the tape and we get to watch more closely as to what happened after the play. And, and even the ESPN box score still says Joe Burrow took nine hits in this game. The Bengals still had two sacks given up and seven tackles for loss allowed in this game. So you, you'd like to see less negative plays, especially in the running game. And even though protection, I think, was better this week, it should have been better when there's no TJ Watt or Micah Parsons on the other side. Quinn and Williams and, and this Jets defensive line, even Carl Lawson got some hits in. They, they made their presence known. I was hoping for maybe a little bit more from this offensive line. That being said, it did feel like a step in the right direction, at least on first watch. And again, the tape doesn't lie. It's something that I will be looking at when I go back and turn on the all 22 and get a look at the tight and, and see what was going on. But at least it, it felt better. I just, there's still room for improvement there, right? And maybe this is just how it goes. And it takes time for these guys to gel and coalesce and continue to get better throughout the year. Yeah, it, it certainly it felt better, and I think they were a little bit better. I think the opponent, you're right. But it's also, you're right, Joe Burrow. And Joe Burrow is better in the pocket. And when Joe Burrow is better in the pocket, he can hide some of those flaws. And, you know, they're still not getting much push in the run game. Um, and I, I do want to talk about Joe Mixon in a second mm -hmm. so we can do that. But overall, offensive line-wise, I think it was a step in the right direction. Far from a finished product, which is okay. Like, that's fine. See, they were flawed the first two weeks. If they had won, then you can live with some of those flaws. But when you lose and you're in danger of falling to 0-3, then it feels like the world is ending. So they get a win, and it's like, okay, well, yeah, there's still a lot of stuff to clean up. Much easier to clean up some stuff when you have a win. And mm -hmm. much more painful to do so when it's a loss. So, uh, yeah, I, I don't think the offensive line was perfect by any stretch. I, I mean, 
the the Burrow touchdown to Chase, he got absolutely drilled on. Yeah, to, in in pre uh, or too, and, and that's what I'm going to be looking at because it looked like it was in the entire offensive line slides right. Jonah has to block inside out. He has to block the defensive tackle, and that just turns Carl Lawson free, which mm -hmm. something doesn't seem right about that. No, and and so is that a communication thing? What you know? What is that? What's the the issue? Because Carl Lawson isn't Micah Parsons, but he's still Carl Lawson. Well, and he's unblocked. Anybody can do that unblocked. Sure. Sure. And so got to avoid that. Yeah. I mean, Burroughs still took big hits, some tough hits. And and even even on the first drive, he took a hit or two where he was completing he completed mm -hmm. the balls downfield. And and it's like, oh, you're looking back and he just pops up, but that, that's the scary part. Um, he Joe got hit in the knee late once, too, from Sheldon Rankins on one of the sacks he took. And I don't know how that's not a penalty, for one, um, especially if he didn't get pushed into Burrow, which apparently he didn't, according to my replies on Twitter. But, yeah, that, that one was rough. He's holding his knee a little bit, getting up on that one. Didn't like that at all. Yeah. Yeah. And I was a little concerned that because he stayed down. And, look, when you have the offensive lineman looking down, that's when it's like, oh, God. And he popped up, and he was limping for a little bit and seemed fine. And after the game, it didn't look like he was walking with any limp. But still scary, mm -hmm. of course. But let's talk about the other Joe a little bit. What do you make of Joe Mixon? Sore ankle after the game. I don't think the offensive line was perfect. We just said that. At the same time, I look, and he's averaging two yards a carry. Samaj P. Ryan averaging what was it it was uh 5.2 yards mm -hmm. yeah 5.2 yards a carry was decisive it, and here's the thing 5.2 yards per carry Samaj P. Ryan's long was seven yards <laughs> so it's not like it he had a 15 system. yarder that juiced the numbers what do you make of that and I know we have to to go back and watch but to me one guy was decisive in hitting the hole and Joe Mixon, it just – whatever it is, he just does not seem in rhythm right now. And I thought that's back-to-back -back weeks. I thought he was pretty good against the Steelers. And then the past couple of weeks, he hasn't been. Yeah, it's 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 a bit strange. It seems like it's a hesitancy thing with Mixon to some degree. You can see this very distinct difference when Pirine comes onto the field in style between the two guys. And credit Pirine making that one cut, finding the lane he wants to attack, hitting the lane, driving his legs. There, there was one play in particular. I think it was a second and four. He gets hit maybe one yard past the line of scrimmage and keeps his feet moving and gets a first down. Ends up getting four or five yards on the play. I, I thought Samaj Piram is really impressive in this game. Maybe Mixon is just banged up. We've seen him on a number of occasions this year. We haven't really talked about him, but we've seen him with his bumps and bruises leave the game for small amounts of time, then come back in or have little nicks. So, so maybe it's as simple as that. But watching live, the impression is that Samaj P. Ryan looked more decisive, looked more poised to take advantage of what was there. And, you know, you're going to have to turn on the tape and see what it is. Maybe they're getting different looks. Maybe it's different. You know, who knows what it is. But the fact is, Samaj P. Ryan's in the game, and the Jets know the Bengals are running the ball to kill the game. They killed mm -hmm. eight minutes yep. with Samaj P. Ryan taking handoffs. And Joe Burrow inexplicably on a play-action play sliding behind the line. I don't know what happened there. The, the broadcast was doing weird things. I don't know if you know this, James. The CBS broadcast cut out for a solid five minutes in the middle of the game. I, so I, I did miss that. a couple plays there, but um, that was a bizarre moment. But Pirine was good when they knew the Bengals were running the ball. And maybe that's the offensive line. Maybe this shows the fungibility of running backs, or maybe there's something just to tick off with Joe Mixon. But that's one that I, I'm going to have to – personally, I, I'll feel more comfortable talking about it after seeing the, the all 20. Yeah, yeah, and we'll, we'll have to do that. I think um... – what happened there, they they did the little play action bootleg. They were hoping Burrow would be by himself and could run for the first down. And they uh -huh. literally said, if there's someone there, don't try to make a miss. Just slide down, stay in bounds, keep that cock running. I think yeah, that's that what weird. it was. And and uh and maybe I'm wrong, but that that's that's how I felt in the moment. And uh obviously got my guy Money Mac missed the the field goal there because he wanted it to stay twenty seven uh twenty seven points. But um overall it's much, much easier to talk about the negatives, like I said. And it's it's going to be a quick flip 
here. I mean, tomorrow they need to start focusing on the Dolphins. You know, yeah, look at the self scout the tape tonight, correct it, and it's Dolphins time. And yeah, and that's uh, who it's gonna be. It's gonna be a quick week here, Jake. The final undefeated team of the AFC travels to Paul Brown Stadium as the Bengals induct their Paycor. next class into the Ring of Honor. What's that? Paycor Stadium. I called it Paul Brown. Yeah. One it's day. It's okay. I do that One too. Day. <laughs> One day. Uh, the last undefeated team in the AFC North is a Bengals Thursday night opponent as they induct Willie Anderson into the Ring of Honor. That's going to be exciting. Excited for everyone who's going to get to go to that game. And, well, we'll have more analysis from this game. It is a quick turnaround, James. You're right. It's a, it's a quick week with Thursday Night Football coming up, but we're going to get back into the tape. We'll have some tape takeaways, and then we'll dive in to week four. Miami Dolphins, undefeated Miami Dolphins <laughs> coming to town. We'll have you covered with all that. The Bengals move to one and two, get into the W column. And until next time, Bengals fans, thanks for listening to the Locked On Bengals podcast. Hootay, and have a good one.